Hey guys, Sir Owen Disney here, and there is two weeks left until SummerSlam. It feels like we just had Battleground, and we already are leading to SummerSlam. Yeah, probably throws me off the fact that July is one of those months where I get paid three times. So that means that I have three weeks of pay because of the way that the dates line up. So yeah, it's kind of strange that we're just getting to the pay-per-view after our last pay-per-view. So yeah, we've got that, and by the time SummerSlam comes out, we should know what's going to come out of Halloween Horror Nights this year. So that's just a speculation. Should have been an announcement tonight. At least we thought there might be. There wasn't one. So I'm here to do your Raw recap. Last night, Houston, Texas was the site, and we started off the show with John Cena coming out. And of course, last week he was absent because he was filming his part in the new Judd Apatow movie. Yeah, it's probably going to be a train wreck. Literally, the movie's called Train Wreck. I hate Apatow. He hasn't been relevant in a long time. Last good movie he did was Funny People. And I don't care what anybody says about if you believe me or not. Cena comes out and he says, last week it was revealed that Plan C was Brock Lesnar. Cena's a marked man by the authority. The Authority want the championship off of him, so they hired a mercenary to get the job done. He has ears, obviously, and he understands that the WWE Universe, they really want to see Brock beat the living hell out of him. And the fans, of course, cheer for it. Brock destroys who he wants whenever he wants. He fights when he wants. He basically sets his own schedule. Cena knows he's going to get a beating at SummerSlam. From a beast. He will fight. He won't be the one who lays down. And he will beat him just like he did in 2012. No one can control him. Not the fans, not the authority, and especially not Paul Heyman. Cue Paul Heyman. Heyman comes out, he says, You know what, I don't think you understand those are mighty big words coming from a man who's about to be turned into a victim. See, Cena, you know, you've never been victimized. Nothing has been heard from The Undertaker since WrestleMania, since his victimization. My client is looking to conquer you. Brock loves to and lives to inflict pain on all of his victims. After SummerSlam, not only will you not be WWE World Heavyweight Champion, you will be beaten, victimized, and conquered. So Cena stops and was like, you know what? Cut the chit-chat. We share this passion. Obviously, you have a passion for three simple letters, E, C, W, and every single time that they are chanted by crowds, you get that smile on your face because you remember just how much passion you put into E, C, W, and the fans in Houston chant for E, C, W, which is nice. And he says that's where we share this common bond. Our common bond is passion. Your passion was E, C, W, and my passion is for this company. Brock may be big, Brock may be strong, but he doesn't have this. He doesn't have heart. I'm heading to SummerSlam, the champion, and I'm walking out with that son of a bitch. Here comes Cesaro. He comes out. Heyman looks kind of uh, confused. Shakes hands anyway, and Cesaro gets on the mic and says he's not going to allow Paul Heyman, his friend, to be insulted like that. John Cena isn't a wrestler. He's a muscled-up walking billboard. He shoots on the fact that he wears tennis shoes. You don't wear tennis shoes in the wrestling ring. You wear boots, obviously. You can't wrestle in sneakers. Simply put, you can't wrestle. John Cena says he's going to wrestle circles around Cesaro and accepts the match, and it's up next. It's our first match of the evening. John Cena and Cesaro in a rematch of what some have called one of the best matches of 2014. In my opinion, it's definitely in the top three, for sure. The Cena Cesaro match was spectacular the first time. And we get a repeat this time around. We pick it up for Matt for the commercial break. Duck Cesaro's clothesline, shoulder block, shoulder block, goes for the proto bomb. Cesaro counters in with DDT, gets a two off of that. He goes for the swing. Internet speculation be damned. And Cena counters into a sunset flip, gets a two off of that. And a float over into a layout power bomb, gets a two on Cesaro. So he goes up top, and he gets knocked to the ring apron by Cesaro. A boot to the face by Cesaro, softens Cena up momentarily, and 
Cesaro hits the outside in superplex on Cena. Tremendous use of his strength. Gets a two off of that. Makes a deep cover. Gets a two off of that. So he charges in. Cena gets the boot up and leaps off the middle turnbuckle with a swing DDT, which gets countered into the giant swing. So the Cesaro swing has been broken out. It's crazy because I heard that it was supposed to be banned until he turned babyface. I guess they re one of two things. Either A, that report was BS, which is a possibility. Or B, maybe Cena is more of a heel than he's supposed to be. Nah, it's probably not the second one. It's probably just, uh, the internet was wrong. That's always the third option. The internet was wrong. So Cesaro locks on a cloverleaf ankle lock, which looks phenomenal, and it gets kicked off by Cena. Cena goes for the STF, and when he tries to turn him, it gets countered, kicked off, and Cena catches Cesaro with a protobomb. The five-knuckle shuffle goes for the AA. Cesaro grabs the top rope, and Cena climbs up with Cesaro on his shoulders, and Cesaro counters off, headbutts Cena off, and goes for a flying body press, of all things. Gets caught. Cena muscles him up. AA tosses him over. He lands on his feet just like Punk did in the match against Cena at Money in the Bank. And... A nice Yakuza kick from Cesaro, and he pops Cena up, Swiss death, 1-2, and Cena kicks out right before 3. So he goes for the Gotch-style neutralizer, twists the neck, and Cena backdrops him out. And of course, Cesaro again lands on his feet. So Cesaro with a big boot, and Cena with a big boot, knocks him back. Cena charges in, Cesaro with a running boot to the face, he goes up top, Cena climbs up, he picks up Cesaro and AAs him off the top rope to the canvas. One, two, three, and Cena wins this non-title match to kick off Raw. Really good match between these two. I like the chemistry between Cena and Cesaro, and I always have. And they put on different matches. Last time, it was a lot longer and a lot more involved. This one worked just as well, but did not have to go as long. It was less than 20 minutes, and it still was really good and a good way to kick off the show. But after this kicked off the show, you wondered what WWE would do to continue the momentum going into it. Because with the three-hour Raws, you always have a lull period in the show. Admit it or not, there is a lull period in these shows. So we come to the back, and Stephanie is trying to stay strong, but she just can't go back there. She's a disappointment to her children, and they don't understand. Triple H says, you know what, this is going to work itself out. Randy Orton shows up, and he wants to talk. And he basically says that I was all set to go. I was going to be the option. I was going to get that world title shot. But Brock Lesnar had to come in and ruin my day. He wants the old plan back. Well, Triple H has every right, being the fact that he is in charge, to change the plan, but he has no reason to. He won't change it because it doesn't matter if the match happens or not. Roman Reigns is going to get involved, and he's going to ruin everything. He's going to topple the plan. So Orton basically says, you know what? I understand what you're trying to say, but he cost me this opportunity, and I'm going to cost him everything. So tonight, I'm going to make an example out of Roman Reigns. I want Roman Reigns tonight in a ring. Triple H says, you know, I can't give you that because Roman already has a match tonight, and that match against Kane. So Orton says, you know what, I don't like Kane. Obviously, I don't like Roman Reigns. Right about now, I don't really like you. So, yeah, that's rather interesting. Randy Orton has never been a favorite of mine, but I will say on this show especially, he has uh, gone several levels up in my book in this show because he showed some more intensity that we haven't seen from the Viper in a long time. And I'm not just talking about intensity of what he did later on the show I'm talking about, he looked like he gave a damn, which is something I haven't seen from Randy Orton in quite a while. Whether he has or not, it seems like he's been going through the motions, but, like the Rob Van Dam syndrome, but still, when it comes down to it, it just seems like Randy Orton has a renewed vigor in his step, and that's good, and same with Alberto Del Rio, but Del Rio is not somebody I can talk about on Raw, I'll talk about him probably uh, this week on SmackDown, and I will because he's facing off against Dean Ambrose, and I'm looking forward to that match, should be pretty good. So Paige comes out, and she wants to set the record straight, that she's young, and she makes mistakes, and when it comes down to it, she let her frustrations get the better of her, and she didn't treat AJ like a friend, she treated her like an enemy friend of me, of course, in this case. She still thinks of AJ as her best friend, though. She crossed the line, and she's understanding of this fact. She'll never be like that ever again. 
she won't react like that ever again. So AJ steps out, and she skips out like she always does, and of course Paige did that when she entered. Oh, Paige, my Casper-looking crumpet, and she gets interrupted, and Paige's like, you know, I had nothing to do with it, and she's like, you know what, don't interrupt me. I understand why you did what you did. You want to be like me? Fine, be like me. Don't play any of those little girl games. You know, if you have to say something derogatory, say it to someone's face like a woman. Like a real woman. And Paige's like, you know what? If you don't believe what I'm saying, then you're crazy. And of course, that's the buzzword. That's the buzzword right there. Obviously, you don't call AJ Lee crazy. And AJ's like, twists her head, of course. is like, you know... Did, I understand, that was a mistake. And they attack. They fight. And she gets tossed out, sent into the barricade, and Paige runs away because AJ has snapped. And we have ourselves a really awesome feud leading into SummerSlam. Uh, this match should be really good. And if you put heat on it and you put a stipulation on it, you know, if it was me, I don't think they'll do this in PG WWE. But you have two ways to go with this. One is the safer op. Well, there's three ways to go. One is the safe option, and you do a submission match. Because obviously AJ's got the Black Widow, and Paige has got the PTO. So you can do submission move versus submission move. Since we're leading to something I've been calling for months, that Swagger and Rusev is going to be a flag match. So Rusev can lose without being pinned or submitted. Makes perfect sense to me. Two, you go with just a basic hardcore match between the two. I don't think they're going to, they may not deliver like Taryn Terrell and Gail Kim and TNA did, but still, it should be a really good hardcore match. Three, you go completely outside of the box and you book a first blood match between the two. Now, that's not something I could see in WWE now, but if this was the Attitude Era or if this was before the PG Era, I think it actually would have been a possibility. It's a blood feud that needs to have blood involved. But in this new era, I don't think you're going to see two divas ble bleeding all over the place, so I would say they're probably going to go with a hardcore match. If they do a first blood match, then it'd be awesome, but I don't think they're going to go in that direction. I think they just do a basic hardcore match between the two at SummerSlam, and they just have a knockdown drag out, and it goes to the limit. I think that's probably the direction I would go in this. <clears throat> so, Triple H and Stephanie come out. And Triple H is disgusted with all the fans for blatantly laughing at Stephanie last week when she was arrested. And basically, he's never going to forgive anybody for us. Yeah, like we care, Hunter. Bree was antagonizing Stephanie the whole time. And Stephanie was just defending herself. All the charges were dropped, except for one, and that is the assault and battery charge. So Stephanie calls Brie out to the ring to try to obviously get these charges dropped, and here comes Chris Jericho. I'm getting a flashback from the era, from the Attitude Era. He says, I apologize for the interruption, and I want to give some sympathy with the song. And busts out Bad Boys, the cops theme. And the fans, of course, sing along, and it's hilarious. So Jericho thinks it's funny, Triple H isn't laughing. And Jericho, of course, makes the joke that was said on the internet earlier last week. You know, Orange is the New Black. It's okay to be a jailbird. And, of course, they got hashtag jailbird trending on Twitter because hashtags are magical, apparently. Jericho wants to give Hunter credit for standing beside Stephanie's side the entire time. But wants to ask one simple question. I'm sure Stephanie's asking herself, why didn't Triple H just leave directly that night? He waited until about 15 minutes after the show before he even decided to step foot in that police station. You know why? It's because she is a, and I knew this was coming, and I was like, he's going to say this on Raw, and he did. Stephanie is simply a filthy, dirty, brutal, bottom-feeding, trash bag, Ho, oh, and then Jericho, of course, gets stopped by Triple H. He's like, shut up. You need to focus not on this, but you need to focus on Bray Wyatt. And Jericho's like, that's the reason I'm out here. I am focused 100% on Bray Wyatt, and I want him tonight, right here, and right now. Triple H says, you know what? You're not going to get what you want, especially after what you just said. So, when it comes down to it, you got to wait till SummerSlam, and you can have your match. So, Bray Wyatt and Chris Jericho officially made for SummerSlam, the second in the three-match series, which is going to end at Night of Champions on my birthday. But tonight, 
and Seth Rollins just Pearl Harbors Jericho from behind with the Money in the Bank briefcase. And tonight, we're going to get Seth Rollins against Chris Jericho later on in the show. And immediately, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I'm really excited for this match. So we get our next match. It is six-man tag team warfare. It is the Intercontinental Champion Johnny Cage, I mean The Miz, teaming with Curtis Axel and Ryback, taking on the WWE Tag Team Champions Jimmy and Jay Uso and Dolph Ziggler. I'm still thinking The Miz is missing a golden opportunity for after he wins the match. He gives an autographed picture of himself smiling with, of course, his aviators to uh, his opponent and leaves him on his chest, kind of like the friendship thing that Johnny Cage used to do in Mortal Kombat. This match was high impact and fast paced in every single word. Ziggler was on some sort of uh, fast forward button. It's like if you hit the fast forward button, Ziggler was on that speed in this match. It was kind of like, I'm not going to say that Dolph Ziggler does this, but I'm like seeing it's kind of like a child on Adderall, to be totally honest. Yeah, he was like all over the place, and it was just insane. Midway through this match, right before, right after the commercial break, you have the tandem of Xavier Woods. Big E and Kofi Kingston come out to scout the opponents, and apparently they attacked uh, Slater Gator on um, Main Event, but I didn't get a chance to watch that, so I may have to start watching Main Event, and I may start recapping Main Event. Um, we'll see. So we pick it up midway through, The Miz with a chin lock on Jimmy, and he elbows his way out, whip in reverse, and kitchen sink from The Miz, he throws the knee up. And he swats at Dolph to get Dolph to go him into the ring. And, of course, he tags in Ryback. Ryback tags in Curtis Axel, I, I guess. Uh, the foot choke under the bottom rope. And he comes off the ropes, hits the knees trembler, gets a two off of that. Tags the Miz and a stomp and a nice overhand right. Chin lock is applied. And, again, the Uso elbows his way out. And Miz goes for the inverted DDT to the knee. And he gets countered and ducks the clothesline. Savat kick to the ribs. He cuts off the kick. And he kicks him off, tagging a Dolph, tagging a Ryback. So the hooking clothesline, a drop kick to Ryback, knocks everybody off the ring apron for good measure. The running splash in the corner hits the reverse neck breaker, and then the heart stopper elbow, and goes for the name dropper. He ducks out of it. Ryback muscles him up for shell shock, and he gets shoved off. Exclamation point DDT does connect from Dolph. And The Miz makes the save right before three. Jay clotheslines Axel to the floor. Simone Suicide Dive connects on one side. Simone Suicide Dive connects with nothing but a neck snap by The Miz, courtesy of the Intercontinental Champion. Ryback goes for a powerbomb. Dolph lands on his feet, hits the zigzag, one, two, three, and the Usos and Dolph Ziggler win this match. Uh, really good fast-paced action between this. Like I said, Ziggler feels like he's on fast-forward sometimes. And when you work that fast, sometimes you can make mistakes. But Ziggler looked pretty good in this match, actually. So it actually worked pretty well. And we still wonder what's going on with Xavier Woods' new group, what where this is headed. Obviously, Mark Henry is going to end up being the anchor of the group. But obviously, he's not even on television yet. So who knows what's going to happen. And it leads, leads more credibility to the fact that Woods is scouting the tag team division so he can see who's going to be a threat. And obviously he's scouting the tag team champion since they were involved in the six man. So I think what I would do in this case, and it's a match I really want to see before everything happens, I want to see the Miz and Dolph Ziggler, since Bo Dallas is now in this, and it's funny because he's actually in the next segment, they're going to have a three-way at SummerSlam, supposedly. Uh, it's not been announced yet. But I'm guessing it's probably going to be a three-way, and I think that they need to start building that up. And if it's going to be a three-way, they have to build it up now because we have our next match. It is Bo Dallas and R-Truth. And Bo comes out, and he says, Truth, you've lost a lot, but I know that if you simply Bo leave, you will win again. So Bo gets the advantage when the bell rings, and he takes advantage and takes the victory lap a little too early. So he gets under the bottom rope. And Truth rolls him up from behind. One, two, three. Another streak has been broken. And our truth is the one who ends Bo Dallas's winning streak. It's rather interesting. So they shake hands. And, um... Hold on. I'm checking this here. So they shake hands after the match is over. And this, of course, leads to... There we go. It basically just leads to craziness because Bo snaps 
and just demolishes our truth and doesn't use the swing bow dog. He uses his uh, double underhook DDT, the Kenta Kabashi DDT that he was using in NXT for a while to beat people. And he's not going to use the, what I like to call the bowlet and the spear in uh, WWE because obviously there's 4,000 people that do the spear now. So yeah, you're not going to be able to use that. But I will say that he probably will use um, a variation, if I had to guess. So, the double under DDT is a better finisher for him. I think it's more impactful, and I think it works. Um, you don't have to do anything with it. You just have to just drop your guy, and it works. So, I like the way this went over, and now you've had Bo lose... You actually have more room to navigate the rest of this. Now, I don't understand why it was truth to beat him. I guess it was one of those, anything can happen in the world wrestling entertainment. But still, it doesn't have the same effect as, anything can happen in the world wrestling federation. It doesn't have the same effect. But still, the thought is there, and that's all that counts, right? So, basically what we had here was a situation where you have Bo Dallas lose... And basically, you have Bo Dallas lose, and now he is on a collision course with, he doesn't care anymore. He's going to go after anyone and everyone now because he lost. And he simply, Bo leaves in himself too much. If he Bo leaves in himself, he can uh, bounce back from this. And I think that the beating on truth is just the beginning here. And I think it works really well that they actually did this. I think it's a good idea. I don't know if Truth was the right idea, but it was got to be somebody, right? So Rusev and Lana come out. Lana basically spouts off about Old Glory, and here comes Zeb and Zach, Zach Ryder. Zeb Coulter and Jack Swagger out, and they basically put over each other's countries, and pretty much Zeb says that... The real Americans, like the flag is all about beer and beautiful women and pickup trucks. I'm like, wow, you're really not getting me get, getting over in the storyline for me because obviously I don't like any of those things. I like beautiful women, but I don't like pickup trucks or beer. I forget that noise. But we're in Houston, Texas, and it was funny because WWE utilized this moment for Lana to go after George W. Bush, which was actually a way to turn him turn Rusev and Lana face, but not in Texas. Anywhere else, but not in Texas. Not one of the Republican states, obviously, that would have not worked there, but Houston, Texas, yeah, that works pretty well to uh, keep a, a heel run there. So, Rusev and Swagger brawl, and they're waving flags before so, and of course, he goes for the accolade, and he gets his ankle picked, Goes for the Patriot Lock, he gets kicked off, and a boot to the face from Swagger, and he rams him shoulder first off the ring apron, so living in a fight another day. So yeah, we are building towards this flag match, and the writing is on the wall. The feud, I don't know if it's going to continue after SummerSlam, it's going to go into Native Champions or not, but what I think will happen, and I think it's the right booking, Rusev does not have to get pinned, Rusev does not have to get tapped out. All that Swagger has to do to win a flag match is capture the flag. Rusev still loses. Swagger still gets his comeuppance. And everyone wins. Rusev doesn't have to uh, lose any face by losing a match because he never got his shoulders pinned in the bat and he did not have to submit or tap out. So, yes. I think it's perfect logical booking and I think it works for me. So, here comes Damian Sandow out. And he's wearing a space suit. And he's pretending like there's no gravity, there's uh, zero gravity, and it's hilarious. And he says, Houston, we have a problem. And he basically says that you have dim wits, nit wits, and half wits, and that's all he sees. That's the problem he has. He says, one small step for man, one giant leap in the toilet for mankind. And he also puts under the rosebuds. And of course, this allows for our next match to bring out Adam Rose. Adam Rose comes out, gets on the mic, he says, you sour, sour, sour little spaceman. You need to come back to Earth. He Right here in Houston, Texas. He doesn't make Foley a cheap pop there. Really nice. Don't be a lemon, be a rosebud. Sandow says, they say in space, no one can hear you scream. Let's see about Earth. So, Sandow attacks. It takes the helmet off, because obviously you can't hit a party foul if someone's wearing a space helmet. 
And sure enough, that happens right after that. Sandow gets turned around and party foul. One, two, three. So Adam Rose wins. I really want to see Adam Rose face off against Sandow as himself. So Sandow facing off against Adam Rose, dressed as Adam Rose. I want to see that happen. I think it's happened on a house show, but I uh, don't know how it would work. It'd be funny to see who he would get as Rosebuds, but yeah. I think that actually needs to happen sometime. Have him wear like a wig and everything. I think that'd be hilarious. But, yeah, they're not going there, at least not now. So, Rose and Sandow continue their uh, feud. I guess you can call it that. Sure. Next match is Roman Reigns and Kane. But, of course, it never gets started because Randy Orton jumps Roman Reigns while he's going to the crowd for his entrance. And Reigns tosses Orton over the barricade because he gets the upper hand. He hits Kane for good measure, and then he hits Orton, and then Kane tosses him in, and Samoan drop, and he runs him in with a clothesline in the corner on Kane, Orton nails him from behind, and a Superman punch to Randy Orton. And, of course, he walks right into the goozle, chokeslammed by Kane. Kane bombs out, and Orton is left alone with Roman Reigns, so he gets to do whatever he wants at this point. He mounts Reigns and starts punching away at the top of the head. A stomp, he ties him up in the ropes, and he kicks him in the chest repeatedly. So he dumps him to the floor, he tosses him into the ring steps, he goes to the opposite side of the ring and tosses him into those set of ring steps. So, he tosses him over the barricade, and he hits the snake by DDT on the floor. He separates the steps, and he rams him face first into the steps repeatedly. And he's like, I'm not done yet. So Orton clears the announce table, making sure to take the iPad and make sure to place it gently on the uh, ground, or give it to a... I believe he gave it to JBL, if I remember correctly, but he threw everything else on the ground. So that stuff's expendable. JBL's iPad is not. So, he picks him up, and... He climbs up on the table after putting him on the announce table. He goes for the RKO on the table. It doesn't break. It's like Matthew of Botchamania. That is the Japanese table, and it doesn't break. So, obviously, that was the plan, and since it didn't work the first time, repeat spot. So, he picks him up, and he RKOs him through the table. It does go this time, and Orton looks like he hurt himself a little bit on this. I really liked Randy Orton in this, and I really like the fact that they're actually building him even though he's Randy Orton, when it comes down to it, Roman Reigns is obviously the person that's going to come away with the bigger uh, win on this one. And to make Orton look as credible as he used to be is quite a feat right now. But Orton was not boring in this. Orton was evil. Orton was vicious. And Orton was the Randy Orton of old. And I really like seeing this. And I think they're going to do a lot with Orton and Reigns going into SummerSlam. And maybe even at Night of Champions, unless we get the match at Night of Champions that I'm suspecting they're going to do. It's Roman Reigns and Triple H. Because obviously Triple H is going to get involved. And he's probably going to pedigree Reigns at SummerSlam and lead to Orton winning. Or try to do that and lead to Orton losing. But either way, we're going to get Triple H and uh, Roman Reigns at Night of Champions. That's my prediction at this point. But in the next match, it is Fondango taking on Diego of Los Matadores. With Torito. And, oh my god, Summer Rae looked gorgeous here. More so than normal. And that's saying something. And Layla. So yeah, of course, the Slayers came out with Diego, and this match was really short. Fondango hits a snap suplex, goes up top of the perfect 10, and Torito is on the top rope opposite and just staring at him. So that distraction allows for Fondango to jump off the top rope, and he gets caught with a 180 sunset flip from Diego, 1-2-3, and Diego wins. Fondango gets up on the apron, looking at... Summer Rae and Layla dancing with Diego and Torito, and he just says, why? And he gets gored off the apron by Torito. I hate this. <clears throat> I'm not gonna lie, I hate this. I hate this. I hate the Los Matadors gimmick. I hate what they've done with it. I think it's dumb. I think it's stupid. I don't think it needs to end. Obviously, I love the Fandango gimmick, but they need to do something with it or get rid of it. They need to do something with this gimmick, and I think the end game here is a new dance partner coming to uh, obliterate Summer Rae and Layla. I think that the right answer I would say right here, the good, the person I'd like to see be the dance partner, would not be a good. I don't know if she's a good dancer or not. So I mean, the person I'd like to see in this role is Sarah Del Rey, but I don't think it's going to happen. It could be, it could be Karma. That'd be a possibility. Um, I'm guessing this is going to be somebody that is going to be big. Somebody to come into the company that is going to, uh... 
I, I thought about a bodyguard type like a Nicole Bass or like a, a China for Fandango and do it in that way. But no, I think it's actually going to be a uh, somebody that's going to make the Slayers pay for uh, leaving Fandango. I think they do something with that. Uh, a lot of people are saying Sasha Banks. Uh, maybe, but I, I don't know. I don't know if Sasha can dance or not. We'll see. So yeah, who knows where we're going to go with this, but I do think that that does lead somewhere, and if it doesn't, then, I don't know, Fondango may not be a gimmick by the end of the year at this rate. I hope I'm wrong about that. I really want to be, because obviously I really love the gimmick, but it's just going nowhere fast right now. We have to end the storyline, have to do something with him to go on to bigger and better things. So of course Stephanie's knocking on the Divas locker room door, and Nikki shows up, and... Stephanie just wants to clear the air and solve all this problem right here and now. And Nikki basically tells Stephanie that she's going to eat a lot of crap and she hopefully likes how it tastes. Yeah, there's always that. We get our, our random bizarre promo of the week of Goldust and Stardust still looking for that cosmic key. And of course, we have a, a blackboard with the cosmic key there, and Stardust is trying to figure out where it is, and Stardust gets distracted by shiny objects, of course. So when he turns around, the cosmic key is something in the box and says, they have it. Who is they? The cosmic key are the WWE tag team titles. They have it being Jimmy and Jey Uso. It writes itself. It makes perfect sense. And of course, Stardust and Goldust say, soon it will belong to us. Their next match, it is Natalia and Naomi, and they're facing off against Alicia Fox and Cameron. Uh, Foxy is the only one not wearing pink and black in this match. Cameron looking more like Britney Spears in this than a Hogwarts uh, dropout. And Naomi stole Bruce the Barber Beefcake's old pink and black stockings. Yeah, that's all that needs to be said about this match. So, Naomi locks in a submission hold, which is uh, really nice, like a, heady, like a head scissors body vice, and gets a win off of that. So, after the match is over, nothing really happened. So, yeah, that was it. Uh, basically, turnabout is fair play. Cameron won, and now Naomi got her win back. So, yeah, the feud between the Funkadactyls continues. Goody gumdrops. <laughs> we got our next match, and it is quite a main event of the evening. It is Chris Jericho against Mr. Money in the Bank, Seth Rollins. This match was awesome, and as we knew it would be when we heard it was going to happen tonight. We pick it up after the commercial break, and Rollins has a grounded Cobra Clutch applied on Jericho. Jericho elbows his way out, and he charges in with a forearm and connects in the corner. On Jericho does Rollins, gets a two off of that. He bites the forehead for good measure, like Jericho's laying across the ring apron. They both get back into the ring. He whips him in, he misses the splash in the corner, and... The shoulder block from Jericho catches the flying forearm, and he tosses him over. Jericho's own momentum carries him over the top, and of course he lands on the apron, goes to the top, and he crowns Rollins, and he goes for the face buster. He gets swatted away, and Rollins breaks out the sling blade of Hiroshi Tanahashi, and we have seen that on his matches lately, but yeah, that looked really awesome, like it always does. Two grounded headbutts from Rollins, and Rollins is kind of like toying with him. He's like paint brushing him. He's like, come on, Chris. Come on, Chris. Fight back. And of course, he eats three vicious chops, whips him into the corner. He charges in. Jericho gets caught with a flatliner to the middle of the turnbuckle, and that makes him go up top. He gets crotched. A big right hand. Jericho climbs up, going for the superplex. It gets blocked. Rollins with a gut shot and a headbutt. He goes for the sunset bomb. It gets countered. And Jericho back body drops him over the top of him onto the canvas below. So Jericho hits the flying body press, gets a two and a half off of that one. So when they both get back to their vertical base, they trade right hands. And of course, Rollins stops any momentum with a spinning back kick to the ribs, comes off the ropes, and he eats a back elbow from Jericho, spins Rollins like a top. And he goes for the lion salt, does Jericho, he misses, and Rollins sits up for the turnbuckle powerbomb, and it connects in the corner, he goes for the curb stomp, and it misses, Jericho rolls him up 1-2, and Rollins kicks out, so he goes to the double leg, going for the walls of Jericho, and Rollins gets to the ropes, Rollins uses the ropes to propel him to do a flip and land on his feet, and of course he nails the leaping back kick to Jericho, 
and basically he goes to try to finish Jericho off with the springboard, springboard off, Jericho catches him with a code breaker, we get the Wyatt interruption, and when the lights come back on, the Wyatt family have surrounded Jericho, and Seth Rollins is nowhere to be found. So, Rowan and Harper mug Jericho, and Rowan hits an elbow drop, of all things. So, they pick up and present Jericho to Bray Wyatt, and Bray makes him eat Sister Abigail, and that's the end. So, great way to uh, end this segment leading into the main event segment, which was Stephanie and Brie Bella's face-to-face uh, -face confrontation. Stephanie comes out. She says, I'm humbled. I don't recall her being in a camel clutch by the Iron Sheik lately. Getting arrested is life-altering. So Brie comes to the crowd with security, and weirdly enough, right as she comes to the crowd, the camera spots her, and they start the Bella Twins music, which is kind of funny. Bad music cue from the uh, sound guy there. Brie's heard enough of this. She wants this stopped right now. Let's get to the point. Stephanie wants the charges drop. Brie says, no. She's like, you know what? I don't deserve this. Like, you don't deserve this. You know what? I think you deserve to go to hell. So Stephanie wants to give Nikki a raise. I'm like, okay, fine. You can give Nikki a raise. That's fine. And I accept that, but I have some demands, and I want my job back. So Stephanie's like, no, I can't really do that. He's like, I'll give Nikki a raise, but I can't give you your job back. She's like, okay, fine, I'll see you in court. So Brie will drop all the charges, 100%, and she gets reinstated. So Stephanie's like, fine, fine, you get your reinstatement. And Brie's like, oh, one more thing. And the crowd knows exactly what's going to happen. Because obviously everyone in this crowd reads the internet, apparently, so they know exactly what's going to happen. He's like, I want to match SummerSlam. Stephanie's like, hmm, okay, that's all you want? You want to match SummerSlam? Fine, you want the Divas Championship? I can do that. Or how about, you're, you're in Total Divas, I can make it happen. We do a Total Br Diva branded match, you can like do a showcase. And she's like, no, I don't want that. I want to face you. Crowd goes crazy. Stephanie starts backpedaling and says, you know what, I haven't wrestled in years, there's no way I can do this match. I'm not a wrestler. And she's like, she starts faking tears, she throws the crocodile, Nancy Kerrigan tears here. So, she basically refuses to lower herself to face Brie Bella in the ring. Stephanie does end up agreeing, though. Brie's on the ring apron here. Stephanie hauls off and slaps Brie, knocking her off the ring apron, and says, I'm gonna make you my bitch. Fans go nuts for this. Brie gets in the ring, double legs her, they start the cat fight, and here comes Jamie Noble, Joey Mercury, and Fit Finley out to try to separate them. And they get them separated momentarily. Here comes Triple H out. And they drag Stephanie away. And they start fighting again. And it's crazy. It's totally crazy how this is the ending segment. And it got over so well. Like, if you're a Divas fan, like to my, my friend Juliet Danielle from The Room, who I'm sure hopefully is watching this right now, when it comes down to it, yeah, this was a really Divas-heavy show. There were four segments of Divas on this show. So yeah, that was insane, but you know what? This show was like all over the place. Like the opening promo with Cena against Paul Heyman worked really well. Basically, you pretty much have written the fans into the door. You have sold SummerSlam. If it was only Lesnar and Cena, fans would want to see it. They want to see, the Cena fans want to see Cena overcome the beast and let anybody else that does not like John Cena want to see Brock Lesnar crush Cena like a grape. So yeah, that pretty much has made the decision of all the fans that want to see this match, regardless what the outcome is. And then Cena comes in and has a tremendous wrestling match against Cesaro, which was phenomenal, by the way. Not necessarily up to the standards of their first match, but it was really good, and it was one of the best matches on the show. And then Paige and AJ had their face-to-face, -face, and AJ heard she was crazy, and of course she sapped. So that building up. And then obviously Triple H and Stephanie are stalking the debris, and then here comes Chris Jericho, and Jericho sings the cops theme, and then Jericho gets attacked from behind from Seth Rollins. That leads to a match later in the show. And... You get the six-man tag match, which is... Really great, like, back-and-forth match with Miz and Rybaxel against Dolph and the Usos. That was good. Truth ends the streak of Bo Dallas, and then Bo snaps and just beats the tar out of him. So, yeah, just... Rusev and Swagger had a back-and-forth. They brawled, leading their flag match down the road. 
Reigns and Kane basically led to Randy Orton showing the Viper of old, and I really enjoyed that. Fondango was embarrassed, but I got to see Summer Rain a short skirt, so that was over. Stardust and Goldust still looking for the Cosmic Key, and that's the tag team titles, and they realize that at this point. Naomi breaks out a new submission hold. Jericho and Rollins has a non-finish, but goes excellently before that, and I know we're going to get a rematch with them down the road. And Stephanie and Brie put on a really great um, showcase of War of Words and the cat fight afterwards to end the show. So yeah, what would I recommend on this show? Um, I'd recommend the opening promo. I'd recommend Jericho and Rollins. I'd recommend Cesaro and Cena. I'd recommend the six-man, Miz and Ray Baxel against Dolph and the Usos. If you want to see Bo snap after losing the streak, I'd recommend Bo and Truth, I guess. Um... You can pretty much fast forward through most of the rest. I'll oh, check out Paige and AJ's promo back and forth. That was worth watching. And um, the stuff with Zeb and Lana involving Swagger and Rusev, yeah, I'd check that out as well. So, yeah, this was it was kind of an all-over-the-place Raw. I mean, I love Adam Rose, and I love Damian Sandow, but they're not doing anything with either one of them. I guess they're just happy to be on television. I don't know why Fondango is getting jobbed out like this. Um, I th it's leading towards Fondango getting a new dance partner. I'm not exactly sure that's going to be right now, but I think it's going to build something. Obviously, Goldust and Stardust are gunning towards the WWE Tag Team Championships, and I think that's going to happen. I was talking on the NXT video yesterday about the Ascension being the fourth team. I think it's probably going to end up being Biggie and Kofi representing Xavier Woods' new uh, stable. So, yeah, that was Raw. And... Interesting edition of Raw. It was, it was kind of there. It was some good stuff and some stuff that was kind of just not really memorable at all, but had a nice build, and we're building towards SummerSlam. We're on the road to SummerSlam. We have two Raws away from SummerSlam, and that's going to flesh out the entire card. Looks to be pretty good this year, and looking forward to the show. It's going to be a lot of rematches in Battleground, but still uh, some new stipulations added to this. No, no Dean Ambrose on this show, so uh, but Ambrose is going to be in action on main event tonight against uh, Alberto Del Rio, which may or may not be on by the time that uh, you watch this video. Who knows? Depends on when uh, you do watch it. So, uh, Pop fans, uh, quick programming note real quick, and I will say this right now. Tomorrow we're going to talk a little TNA Impact. I know there has been some issues lately with um, Spike TV supposedly saying that they are canceling Impact. We don't know anything as of yet. We know what TMZ has said, and uh, we know how much to believe TMZ. So, until everything is official, we can't really uh, judge that situation, but Impact is hot in New York, and that will continue. I'll be talking about that tomorrow. This Thursday will actually be AJ's Zombie Reviews. We're going to be doing Dead Snow 2, Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies, and two other zombie films that just got released recently, so that's going to be there. So you're getting an additional movie review from AJ this week. And, of course, Friday we're going to uh, get... Guardians of the Galaxy and Get On Up, as well as Cavalry and um, The Signal, and probably two other more, two more other video to go on that video. Saturday we'll return Ashley to Pop. He will bring his Game In with Ash segment, and that's going to uh, be going out on Saturday. This Sunday, new verses coming up. It's uh, True Crime is your cryptic comment, so that's coming this coming Sunday. And when I get any brand new Halloween Horror Nights news, which I thought we were going to get an announcement over the weekend, thought we'd get an announcement last night, but we didn't, so because of that factor, can't really say anything until something happens, but something very soon should happen. So that's your programming note. As always, if you like these videos, tell your friends about them, leave a comment, do subscribe, help spread the word about Pop. If you haven't yet, go to Facebook and click like on our Facebook fan page here on Pop. It is Soro and Disney Pop on Facebook. If you like to send me a friend request on Facebook, let me know that you're a fan and uh, you like the content when you uh, send me the friend request so I know and to add you obviously if you are a fan of pop you can do that at Owen Disney if you'd like to tweet me it's at Sir Owen Disney last but certainly not least you want to send your thoughts comments queries and opinions you want to talk wrestling with me either WWE or TNA or if you want to talk about my former wrestling career which hopefully will be uh, returning to uh, the uh, returning soon hopefully it's what I'm um, fingers crossed something's actually going to happen for next month. We'll see what happens. Might be going back home again. We'll see. Hopefully so. That's up in the air at this point. But hopefully I'll be returning home next week. If any of you uh, people that know about my wrestling career know about, I have one home in professional wrestling, and I may be returning there next month. Fingers crossed. 
So, we've got that, and uh, if you'd like to talk Disney or Universal, Halloween Horror Nights with me, you want to talk theme parks in general, you want to ask me questions that I can't answer on here for good reason, or if you'd like to send your versus ideas or segment ideas, or if you want to become a podcaster yourself, send your content, and you can send anything to my email, sorrowandisney at gmail.com. In the meantime, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching, and until tomorrow, boys and girls, that's all i got to say about that.